Um abraço. Bom, então, let's start. So, it's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Eduardo Amarante. Eduardo obtained his... Ama PhD. Amarante sou eu, pera, Amarante sou eu. <risos> Amaral. Eu falei Amarante? É Sorry. É muito amor, né? <risos> so, let's start again. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Eduardo Amaral. He obtained his PhD at the Department of Immunology, University of São Paulo, under Maria Regina de Imperio Lima's supervision, same as me. We are scientific brothers, oh. <laughs> so uh, bros. So in 2016, he joined Alan Scher's group at the Laboratory of Parasitic Diseases in the NIH, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease where he is currently an immunology research fellow. Eduardo has been contributing to the understanding of the molecular mechanisms involved in the pathology of tuberculosis, especially those related to the innate immune responses and necrotic forms of cell death. No less important, he is married to my former PhD student, my lovely scientific <laughs> daughter, and he is also Bella's father, as you see. So, <laughs> today he'll talk about tuberculosis in diseases. Thanks, Edu, to Thanks, join Karina. us in the first. Thanks, Ka. Thanks, um, Gustavo, for inviting me to give this uh, talk. And actually, it's a great opportunity uh, because then we can like read more and more and see that actually uh, there are a lot of gaps that that we have to uh, answer right and fill with with our experiments right so let's start so let me just like uh, like a laser point here so let's talk about cell death right so because it's important to um, ask the questions that are profound that profoundly will change the way we live and die and that's why we are here right taking this uh this class to better understand the the the, the different mechanisms that our cells undergo uh death so uh in the for many 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 years let me just move there um for many 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 years uh, two major forms of, of, of cell death were considered to exist, apoptosis and necrosis. So apoptosis is considered as a non-inflammatory form of, of, of cell death and is characterized by cell shrinkage, uh, shrinkage, uh, cytoplasmic blebbings, chromatin, uh, chromatin condensation. So the organelles are intact and, and we do see a fragmentation of the nuclei. On the other hand, necrosis, which we consider as a pro-inflammatory form of, of, of cell death, uh, is characterized by, um, by loss of plasma membrane integrity, uh, cell swelling, nuclear swelling, and lysosomal breaking down. So we consider this form of death as inflammatory because we uh, usually we see a release of a large amount of damps danger signals that will, in this case, promote uh, inflammation and also can sensitize uh, other cells to, uh, to undergo death. For example, in the case of ATP. So when you have extracellular ATP, uh, this will activate P2X7 receptor and now that these cells will uh, uh, die through, through necrosis <clears throat> by different ways like, like paraptosis and other pathways as well. So um, since uh, the discovery of apoptosis in 1972, we had a like, huge gap in, in terms of uh, new discovery and new pathways related to, to other forms of death. And since 2000, uh, we start to see, uh, to understand better that necrosis can be regulated by, by different molecules, by different pathways. And we now uh, are, are understanding better 
paraptosis, necroptosis, atosis, netosis, parpinatos. Um, paraptosis, which we're going to spend more time talking about today. And last year, this new form of the cell death was described and named as uh, cuproptosis, which is in, uh, induced by uh, Cooper. Um, so, among the cell deaths, so we have uh, necrotic cell death, we have the typical one, which, which we, we call as accidental cell death, which is unregulated, induced by extreme, extreme physical chemical stimuli, which leads the plasma membrane breaking down. For example, if we have cells and then we just put in the freezer in the minus 80 and then thaw these cells, they'll die. So there is no way to control that form of death. However, among the regulated form of cell death, we have two groups caspase dependent and caspase independent uh, form of death. Among the caspase dependent, we have paraptosis, which uh, is uh, uh, triggered by, induced by the inflammasome activation, leading to the cleavage of casdermin D, which in the, this case makes pore on a plasma membrane. And that's how cells die uh, through necrosis. Uh, among the caspase independent, we have uh, several uh, pathways, but I'm gonna highlight two here today. Uh, necroptosis, which is uh, modulated by the activation of RIP kinase one and three, which phosphorylates this molecule called MLKL, which uh, similarly to gasdermin D will make pore on a plasma membrane, leading to plasma membrane break and down, uh, plasma membrane rupture, sorry. So uh, in the case of ferroptosis, which was first described in 2012, this form of death is triggered by iron of intracellular iron overload, uh, which leads to a process called lipid peroxidation. And distinct from uh, uh, paraptose and necroptosis, the way of this, the cells here die through necrosis is totally independent on, on on pore formation. So basically, uh, this lipid peroxide will destabilize the plasma membrane integrity, and that's how cells will die. And this happened due to the, the, the uh, inactivation of, uh, or inhibition of uh, the enzymatic activity of this enzyme called glutathione peroxidase 4. And this happens, in, uh, and this was associated with the glutathione depletion. So uh, this was uh, the first paper that sh showed ferroptosis. Uh, this was published by uh, Dixon and, and Stockwell. And this story actually uh, it started like uh, in 2003 in, uh, when um, Stockwell's lab started to have like a, a decided to, to, to screen a bunch of small molecules uh, that would no, uh, induce non-apoptotic cell death. And they found one compound called arresting, which is uh, described here as ERA. So when they incubate um, a fibrosarcoma cell line with uh, arresting, they start to see that these cells uh, uh, was, uh, were undergoing uh, necrosis. However, when they incubate these cells treated with arresting with iron chelation, which means they're gonna remove a, 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 a free iron from the system, now these cells are become more resistant to, to, to arresting effect. And they saw that this form of death was associated with the induction of ROS and lipid peroxidation. And more importantly, when, um, when uh, Dixon treated uh, the resin uh, treated cells with uh, ferrostatin, which is a lipid peroxidation inhibitor, uh, this compound prevented uh, the resting induced necrosis. And, they, and because of the, the need of lipid peroxidation and iron for the induction of this pathway, they named this, this form of death as ferroptosis, which ferro in Greek means iron and ptosis failing. And basically in characterized ferroptosis as a non-apoptotic iron dependent and oxidative cell death. In terms of morphology, that's uh, what, what they found. So when they performed uh, electron microscopy in, in cells, uh, uh, 
that were treated with different compounds to induce paraptosis, apoptosis, necrosis, and autophagy, they, they saw a major difference in, in, in how, uh, in the morphology of, of the mitochondria. And here I listed some of the major features of, of apoptosis. So similar to other uh, necrotic cell death, we see uh, plasma membrane rupture. And in the case of the cytoplasm, we see cytoplasmic swelling. The mitochondria looks like it's smaller and dense. Uh, they also see reduction of mitochondrial crystal and, and leakage of the outer um, uh, mitochondrial membrane. In terms of the nucleus, they look normal and there is no uh, chromatin condensation as we see in apoptosis. So uh, usually this form of death is associated with iron and ROS accumulation, lipid peroxidation, activation of, of MAP kinases, inhibition of glutathione peroxidase, four, um, glutathione depletion, increased NADH oxidation, and release of damp, as I mentioned before, for example, uh, HMDB1 and ATP. And all the time that people come and ask me, okay, so what is the marker of herptosis? What is actually the major player that I could like look at and, and, and see and define that our, my cells are undergoing uh, uh, herptosis? And this is because in the case of paraptosis, if you look at the cleavage of gasdermin D, you can, along with the release of LDH, you can see, okay, so we can define uh, we're having uh, paraptosis in our culture. In the case of, of necroptosis, for correlation of MLKL. But how about uh, ferroptosis? So there is no specific marker, and usually you have to combine different um, parameters to define that uh, if you have or not ferroptosis. And, and usually what I do, I, I look at iron ROS concentration, lip oxidation, uh, expression of GPX4 that sometimes is reduced. And, and glutathione is actually the, the gold standard in this case, because uh, in the absence of glutathione, this will directly affect uh, the activity of GPX4 in preventing lipid peroxidation. And of course, it's important to treat these cells with um, with uh, any of the uh, compounds known to prevent lipid peroxidation to be, to, to, to be able to see if uh, ferroptosis is, uh, is happening in, in, in our culture, so in our cell cultures. So uh, the, the, basically the, the misregulated ferroptosis has been implicated in several diseases, for example, uh, cancer, neurotoxicity, uh, neurodegenerative disease, uh, lupus, colitis, fibrosis, renal failure, uh, infectious disease, and, 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 and some kind of steroid inflammation as well. So as I mentioned before, um, this form of death is induced by the accumulation of lipid, perox uh, of lipid peroxides on biological membranes. However, lipid peroxidation is a process that happens all the time in our cells in a steady state. And this is because uh, our mitochondria generates mitochondrial superoxide, which reacts with iron in a ferric form. As a result of this reaction, we have the release of oxygen and iron in a ferrous form, which is important for uh, the phenol reaction. So basically this iron react, react, will uh, react with uh, hydrogen peroxides. And as a product of this reaction, we will have water and the release of hydroxyl radicals. These radicals will react to the lipids on biological membranes, mainly lipids that are polyunsaturated fatty acids, leading the oxidation of these lipids and the formation of lipid hydroperoxides. Our cells, to avoid the accumulation of these lipid rods, will uh, Induce the expression of GPX4 along with generation of glutathione. 
So glutathione in this case will be utilized by GPX4 to reduce oxidized lipids into a non-toxic lipid alcohol form. However, under stress conditions, for example, in uh, um, infectious disease, in, the, in my case, uh, that I, I, I've been studying for many, many years, uh, we have two events happening in parallel. So the, uh, the first uh, event is iron overload, which in this case will feed more phenol reaction, amplifying the generation of hydro, uh, lipid, uh, lipid rods. On the other hand, iron can be utilized by lipoxygenases to induce lipid peroxidation. So basically lipid peroxidation can be induced through phenol reaction and also through the activity of lipoxygenases. The second event that happens um, is the depletion of glutathione and selenium. And both are important cofactors for uh, the activity of GPX4. So as a uh, result of the, the uh, as a uh, as a result of this uh, failure uh, in in host antioxidant response, our cells will uh, accumulate the toxic form of this lipid rods, leading to the plasma membrane stabilization, and that's how cells die through through uh, And because it's a pretty new form of, of cell death, there are many pieces of this puzzle that we have to understand better and see how um, uh, this um, pathway can be regulated. Uh, and there are some uh, uh, metabolic pathways that uh, it are important for regulating this form of death. In, the, in this case, our meta met metabolism, ROS uh, uh, metabolic pathway, glutathione and lipid metabolism as well. And we're gonna discuss a little bit about each of them. So in the case of, of, um, of lipid metabolism, so Dixon uh, in 2015 decided to, to look at the gene profiling of, of cells that were stimulated uh, with uh, compounds that were known to induce ferroptosis in the case of RSL3 and ML162. So both basically inhibits GPX4. And he found that ACSL4 and LPCAT3 are both uh, similarly expressed in, uh, uh, in, in, in those two different uh, conditions. And because of that, uh, they found in this paper, they suggest in this paper, these two genes as essential um, for the execution of fructosis induced by the inhibition of GPX4. And they are important because um, those both genes are involved in activating and incorporating polyunsaturated fatty acids into uh, membrane uh, lipids. So one year, and later, this paper came out showing the importance of ACL, ACSL4 to uh, modulate ferroptosis. So basically, uh, what the, these authors, they were, they, why they decided actually to look at ACSL4, uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, the activation of polyunsaturated fatty acid uh, and its insert, insertion in, 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 in the biological membrane is important for the induction of ferroptosis. And they want to know if uh, in the absence of ACSL4, uh, the cells will be more resistant to ferroptosis um, due to lowered uh, uh, PUFA activation. So to do so, they, they generated a uh, 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 fibroblast. Uh, deficient in, in, in ACSL4. And then they treated these cultures with uh, RSL3, which is a non-GPX4 inhibitor. So as we can see here with the change in, in RSL3 concentration, wild type cells, they die quickly. However, when they look at the cultures that were deficient in, in ACSL4, uh, they found that these cultures now, they were resistant to ferroptosis. And then when they add back 
the gene into the knockout, these cells now they die due to the GPX4 inhibition. Suggesting that the, the presence of ACL cell 4 is important for PUFA activation and for apoptosis induction. So then they uh, um, made a huge screen in several uh, uh, um, breast cancer uh, cell lines. And they found that some of these lines were um, deficient in, in, in ACSL4, and some of them expressed uh, this, this protein. Um, then when they uh, stimulated those different cells with uh, RSL3 to inhibit GPX4, they found that the cells that expressed uh, ACSL4 um, they die quickly compared to the cells that do not express uh, the, this, this molecule. Then they decide to overexpress uh, ACSL4 in the cultures that were, that were deficient in, 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 for this molecule. Uh, and then they uh, stimulated these cells with GPX4 inhibitor. And as you can see here, now when these cells start to express ACSL4, they now become susceptible to, to ferroptosis. So basically in the lipid metabolism, um, ACSL4 is important for activating uh, a polyunsaturated fatty acid, generating this polyunsaturated uh, this PUFA CoA and CoA and um, LPCAT3 is important for the insertion of this uh, PUFA into, into the membrane. And this uh, PUFA now will be a substrate for lipid peroxidation uh, in the case of phenol reaction and also for, for lipoxygenase. And that's how this cell, uh, these uh, lipid uh, get oxidized and, and cells will die through Ferroptosis. Another important component of this pathway is RNA metabolism. So as I mentioned before, uh, to have this form of death, we have to have accumulation of iron intracellularly. And how our cells can get iron? So uh, there are actually several ways to have iron in, in the cytosol. So the first one is through transferring receptor. So transferring uh, when bound to iron, uh, uh, binds to uh, transferring receptor, and this will induce a, uh, um, a, a endosome. And inside the endosome, uh, the iron gonna be released and convert to uh, ferrous form by this, this uh, enzyme. And, uh, and, the and the iron in this case will be uh, translocated into the cytosol through this transporter called DMT1. So in the absence of DMT1, you're gonna reduce the uh, level iron pool in the cytosol, but you're gonna have a huge concentration of this uh, 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 micronutrient in, inside of, of, of the en endosomes, for example. So in this case, iron can be in the cytosol can be utilized by phenol reaction and also by lipoxygenase to induce lipid peroxidation and, and it may leave thoroptosis. Another way to get iron uh, is through ferritin and why? So ferritin in this case will work as a, uh, an iron a natural iron chelator uh, and gonna store uh, iron inside of, of its complex. However, uh, there is a process that was described in 2014 and, and in more detail in 2016 uh, called ferritinophage, which is a autophage process of ferritin. And this is mediated by an NCOA4. So, and uh, basically uh, ferritin will uh, uh, on, undergo degradation and, and, and iron in this case will be released in, into uh, the cytosol. 
So iron can be exported to, to exocellular milieu through ferroporting, but in some conditions uh, of stress, we have the inhibition of, of ferroporting. So this is gonna help um, the, 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 the accumulation of, of iron in, intracellularly. Another way to have iron is through heme degradation. And this will be catalyzed by a, an enzyme called uh, hemoxygenase one. So hemoxygenase in this case will, uh, uh, through the degradation of, uh, of heme, will release three byproduct, uh, byproducts in, uh, as, as we can see here, carbon monoxide, biliburdine, and iron. So those are the ways that uh, cells can get more iron intracellularly. Another metabolic pathway important for controlling ferroptosis uh, is uh, glutathione metabolism. So similar, similarly to, uh, uh, similar to other metabolic pathway, pathways and glutathione uh, uh, metabolism, uh, is tightly regulated by different enzymes. I don't have time to go through each one uh, today, but I wanna highlight here that this process is start, uh, it starts with um, uh, the uptake of cysteine uh, by this complex called cysteine X, uh, which is uh, formed by two subunits. So SLC7A11 and L uh, SLC3A2. So cysteine will be quickly uh, convert in cysteine and cysteine will uh, act as a precursor for glutathione generation. So when we have glutathione in this case, um, this uh, molecule will be uh, utilized as a cofactor for uh, glutathione peroxidases. In the case of, of GPX1, it will be important for detoxify cells uh, from hydrogen peroxides. As a result, we're gonna see the release of, of water. And in the case of GPX4 specifically, will be important for uh, avoiding a lipid peroxidation, uh, accumulation of lipid peroxides in membranes. However, uh, the results of, result of this reaction, as a result of this reaction, we will have the accumulation of oxidized form of glutathione. And this is not good for our cells because uh, this uh, oxidized glutathione can react to, to proteins and modify the, co the conformation of this protein through a process called, called glutathionylation. So to avoid this detrimental uh, process, our cells have to convert oxidized glutathione back into reduced form. And these will be catalyzed by different enzymes, as I'm, and I'm highlighting here the most important in, in, this, in this recycling pathway, which is glutathione reductase. So sirtuin, COQ10, and NADPH are also important for uh, this recycling uh, process of, of a glutathione. And here I brought some um, uh, inhibitors that have been shown to induce or prevent ferroptosis. And most of these compounds are um, targeting uh, uh, players in this pathway that are important for uh, the generation of glutathione. Uh, in the case of protection, chelation of iron and also um, inhibition of uh, lipid peroxide. So basically there are ways to target uh, this pathway and, prove and, and modulate uh, uh, ferroptosis. So just to summarize this part in combination, all of these three metabolic pathways. So we have, uh, we need iron to, to, to induce this pathway. We need the activation of polyunsaturated, of a specific forms of polyunsaturated fatty acids. In, in this case, um, uh, the iron will be important for induction of, of ferroptosis through phenyl reaction and through um, uh, activity of lipoxygenases in this PUFA. 
And, and the glutathione pathway is important for the generation of, of glutathione, which is the important cofactor uh, for, for GPX4 in preventing, uh, in converting uh, uh, oxidized uh, lipids into uh, non oxidized in reduced form. And since GPX4 is important for uh, regulating uh, these traumas of death, so this paper came out in 2018, if, yeah, if I'm not wrong. Yes, 2018 in cell, uh, that clearly show uh, that the activity of GPX4 is critical. And um, what they did is, um, Basically, they generate a mutant cells that um, express GPX4, but they are defective in incorporating selenium. So GPX4 is a selenium protein, so it needs selenium uh, uh, into its uh, um, catalytic uh, site uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to work properly. So they look at if this mutation will affect GPX4 expression. By RNA levels, there is no change. However, when they look at protein levels, they see more protein for GPX4. However, when they look at the activity of this, this GPX4, the activity was reduced. So basically, the incorporation of selenium in, in this enzyme is important for uh, its activity. And of course, when they uh, stimulate these cells with compounds that are known to induce uh, necrosis, these cells are now extremely susceptible to undergo death. And the mice that actually uh, display this mutation, they die quickly, suggesting that the activity of GPX4 is fundamental for, for um, cell survival. So although GPX4 is known as a major regulator of, of ferroptosis by utilizing reduced glutathione to damp lip rods in biological membranes, there are other players that, are, that, that prevent ferroptosis through a uh, GPX4 independent path uh, manner. So FSP1 uh, is known to uh, convert oxidized uh, COQ10 into reduced COQ10, and COQ10 is, is important for uh, is important uh, an important antioxidant molecule to to damp and uh, lipid um, uh, peroxide. So GCH1 generates BH4, which is uh, works similarly to, to COQ10 to, to bring down the levels of, of lipid ROS, but also these uh, molecules uh, have, have been shown to, to modulate uh, the concentration of PUFA in biological membrane. There's another one, and the HODH is known as a mitochondrial suppressor. Uh, for a pathway and works similarly and, uh, as uh, FSP1. So basically uh, convert oxidized glutathione, uh, uh, sorry, COQ10 into reduced COQ10. And this will be important for uh, bringing down the levels of, of lipid peroxidation. So, and how about uh, ferroptosis in cancer? So, um, as, as you may know, cancer cells, they develop resistance to, to apoptosis, non-apoptotic uh, cell death modalities, including ferroptosis. So cell death, uh, 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 cells that develop resistance to conventional therapies or metastatic uh, cancer cells, they have been, uh, uh, <clears throat> they, they display enhanced sensitivity to ferroptosis. So some of, uh, of cells that, uh, can, uh, tumor cells that shows mutation in RAS, they are sensitive to ferroptose. And why this happened? Because these cells, they, they show accumulation of iron intracellularly, and this is due to upregulation of transferring receptor on cell surface. And also they display uh, reduction in, in ferritin. So basically they, take, they can die, I mean, they die, they could die quickly, but they are tumor uh, cells, they grow like crazy, right? 
And this is because these cells also present uh, other on oncogenes, uh, uh, such as BRF and, uh, and MYC. And these guys are important for boosting antioxidant response through nerve 2 activation, leading to increased uh, levels of glutathione. And these antioxidant response will be important to prevent uh, um, this iron accumulation. And that's how these cells can grow like crazy. So that's why targeting regulatory elements of, of apoptosis help, uh, has been considered as a potential target for, for uh, therapeutic interventions. So as you may know, P53 uh, is a nuclear transcription factor that uh, for a pro uh, and have, uh, has pro-apoptotic functions. And over 50% of the human cancers, uh, they carry loss of function of these uh, uh, mutations in, P in P53. So basically, some most of the cancer uh, cells they they have this kind of mutation. So and this paper came out, uh, uh, I think, in 2006, 16 or seventeen. I, mean, I can't remember exactly. Um, and showing the importance of P53 in regulating ferroptosis. So basically, they generated uh, P53 uh, knockout cells. And they look at the expression of SLC7A11 uh, in these cells. So as I mentioned before, this is one of the subunit important for uh, system NAX and, and, gluta and cysteine, up, cysteine uptake, which uh, will, lead, uh, will be required for glutathione generation. So in fact, cells that are deficient in P53, they, they showed uh, increased uh, cysteine uptake, which makes sense because they do have more uh, uh, cysteine max expression. When they uh, treated uh, these, um, when they induced ferroptosis in these cell cultures, as expected, white type cells, they undergo ferroptosis. However, P53 knockout cells, they become now resistant. And when they add P53 white type back in these cultures, they see now that these uh, cells die through, through ferroptosis. And when they generate these uh, the over, uh, the system in which they, do, they have overexpression of, of, of system max, they see now that, that the tumor, they grow faster, basically suggests that P53 is important for modulating a glutathione metabolic pathway. Another component of these uh, of these of the regulation of ferroptosis is mediated by the immune response, and this was uh, uh, shown in this uh, beautifully in this paper. So basically, it, uh, it is known uh, that cancer immunotherapy restores and enhances the, the, the effector function of CD8 T cells in the uh, tumor uh, microenvironment. Uh, basically, when they treated mice uh, uh, bearing this uh, ovarian tumor um, uh, uh, cells, they, they saw a, a huge impact in terms of a tumor weight. So as expected, they see less, uh, like a smaller uh, uh, tumor uh, weight. However, this uh, reduction or protection uh, was uh, associated with increased lipid ROS generation. So because lipid ROS is important for ferroptosis, they thought, oh, maybe uh, the enhanced activity of CD8 T cells, and they show in the paper that when you do this kind of therapy, you see more CD8 uh, uh, effect, uh, activation. So they thought that maybe ferroptosis is playing a role in, in, in this, in, 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 in suppressing the tumor growth. So what they decided to do is they decided to treat mice uh, that were under uh, uh, chemotherapy like PDL1 uh, and CTLA4 uh, uh, therapy with uh, a lipid peroxidation inhibitor. So as we can see here, comparing the blue line and the red line, 
So when they treat it uh, with, uh, uh, with, when they, uh, with uh, anti uh, PDL1 and CDA4, they saw a uh, reduced volume of the tumor. But then when they put together uh, um, uh, the lipid peroxidation inhibitor, now they reverse this, this kind of uh, 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 effect of this therapy suggesting that uh, lipid peroxidation and ferroptosis is playing a role in, in killing these tumor cells. So then, uh, because in this paper, they saw that CD8 T cells were secreting tons of gamma, they decided to look at if gamma is playing a role in this, uh, um, in this phenotype. And same thing, so when they gave gamma to the mice, so they saw uh, a smaller uh, tumor volume, but then when they treated uh, these mice with a uh, um, lipid peroxidation inhibitor, this uh, tumor, now they were growing uh, faster. And they look at, also they look at uh, how gamma was interfering with, uh, was inducing ferroptosis in this case. And they saw that gamma was blocking the induction of system next. So basically blocking the induction of uh, the generation of glutathione. So uh, to, to make sure that this was happening uh, at cell level, they, uh, they incubate uh, B16, uh, cells with um, uh, from from white type and also deficient in in gamma receptor in the presence with CD8 isolated from, from uh, OT1 in a ratio of one to one. So then they look at uh, this the lipid peroxidation and cell death of the tumor cells. And as we can see here, when they when they induced ferroptosis, these cells became more susceptible to ferroptosis. Uh, because they saw more lipid peroxidation and more um, uh, and more death. However, tumors that were deficient in in gamma uh, receptor signaling, they they were protected against this form of, of death. So basically, they conclude in this paper that gamma released from CD8 downregulates system X, which impairs the uptake of cysteine and glutathione generation by the tumor cells, in this case, promote uh, a um, lip peroxidation uh, mediated for uh, ferroptosis. So in the case of, of uh, autoimmunity, um, we, uh, there are several uh, diseases that actually uh, ferroptosis has been point to play a role. So uh, such as, um, uh, Ariopite inflammatory uh, um, myo my myopathy, uh, lupus, um, arthritis, uh, sclerosis, and, and IBD. So I don't have time to go through all of these diseases, but in general, the mechanism is quite similar. So uh, we're going to discuss more about lupus and what happens with in, in, in lupus. So as you may know, lupus is a prototype of autoimmunity char characterized by chronic inflammation and high levels of, of autoantibody and may affect different organs. So the central feature of this uh, form uh, of this disease is the uh, accumulated uh, of cell debris, uh, a result uh, from uh, different forms of death, elevated type one interferon, um, increased neutrophils in, in the circulation, uh, some defect in neutrophil, uh, in neutrophil function, such as impaired um, phagocytosis. They usually form aggregation and they undergo death quickly. Uh, they also, uh, uh, in this disease, it's also uh, uh, known to find increased out antibody production, including an uh, out to neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. So this suggests that um, the neutrophil death here is something important to determine this, the progression of this disease. And that's uh, what this uh, uh, group uh, decided to look at, what's going on in neutrophils. 
So uh, there is this uh, ANIMA model, uh, which is called as NRL uh, slash LPR that develop um, autoimmunity disease and, and rapidly in lupus. And here is the control animal uh, for, for this susceptible one. So they isolate cells, neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, and look at GPX4 expression in these cells. So as we can see here, there is no change in GPX4 expression in both lymphocytes and monocytes. However, when they look at the neutrophils in the mice that are um, uh, prone to induce lupus, they saw reduced expression, protein expression of, of GPX4. And here uh, it's like one way they used uh, to, to visualize uh, lupus progression is to look at the size of, of the lymph nodes. So in the white type condition, that's the size, the normal size. When, uh, uh, when they look at the, the lymph nodes from, from the lupus susceptible animal, they see a huge increase in, 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 in their lymph nodes. When they treated uh, these mice with corticoids, of course, they saw less uh, 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 like reduced uh, size in, 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 uh, in the lymph nodes in, in these animals under corticoid treatment, which is totally uh, none because you're just bringing down the inflammatory response, right? So uh, because they saw less GPX4, they, and, and in the paper, they also see higher lipid peroxidation, they decide to treat these mice with uh, a, a lipid peroxidation inhibitor. And they saw a smaller, a, a huge reduction in, in, in the lymph node size. size suggesting that lipid peroxidation is playing a role in, in the progression, in determining the progression of lupus. So next they decide to look at in, in, in normal mice, if, if we deplete GPX4 in neutrophils, uh, what, what happened? So they used a weird approach, which is not specific to, to to uh, neutrophil, so they used a discrete system um, in which they crossed GPX4 flux animals with um, lysa and Cree, which depletes GPX4 in the myeloid compartment, including neutrophils. Um, then they decided to look at the lymph nodes and spleens later on. So after a year, they saw that um, this mice deficient in GPX4, they develop lupus spontaneously without any, any, any treatment. Suggesting that the expression of GPX4 in neutrophils is important for uh, uh, this kind of autoimmunity disease. And more specifically, they, they look at um, the mechanism by which this is happening and the GPX4 expression is controlled. And basically they, they conclude that the, the, the expression of the inhibition of GPX4 expression in this case is controlled by type one interferon, which is found higher in, 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 in this group of patients. Um, so in this case, type one interferon through, uh, uh, through, through the activation of its receptor leads the activation of this transcription factor called CREN, uh, CREN, a, uh, CREN alpha. So CREN alpha will bind to the promoter of, of GPX4 and block the induction of GPX4. So in this case, uh, the absence of GPX4 will lead the accumulation of lipid peroxide on biological membrane and cells will die through, through necrosis. And this is a, a, a and, and the authors think that this will promote uh, progression, uh, lupus progression. In the normal scenario, mice, they don't develop lupus, but when we uh, see, when, when they knock out GPX, they lead GPX4 in, in those, uh, in myeloid cells, they see that, neutrophils on the go for apoptosis, and now these animals show uh, uh, lupus phenotype. Uh, 
where uh, uh, in this case, when we, in which we have mice that are prone to, to, to develop lupus and they treat it with uh, a ferroptose inhibitor, they now see alleviation of these uh, uh, symptoms of the, the lupus. So suggesting that um, the ferroptotic path, uh, the ferroptosis of neutrophils uh, is determining um, the, the progression of lupus in, uh, And this was very, uh, very interesting because um, in 2001, this paper uh, came out uh, saying that mice deficient in nerve to develop lupus. And this is very intriguing, uh, interesting because nerve to is known as, an, as a master regulator of antioxidant genes. So nerve 2 is a transcription factor that induces a bunch of antioxidant genes and genes that are important for iron and glutathione metabolism. So later on, uh, uh, this group, and uh, including this guy, which is my collaborator, collaborator uh, they, um, they look at to BAC1. So BAC1 is known as a nerve 2 suppressor. So basically, when they depleted back one in MRL LPR mice, their lupus prone um, model, they saw that these animals uh, now they can uh, they are more resistant to 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 undergo lupus compared to to the Y type mice, suggesting that the hyperactivation of nerve 2 is important for controlling lupus. So uh, I'm almost, uh, I'm just going to the last part, which is ferroptosis infectious disease. I, I just decided to include this, uh, 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 the role of ferroptosis in this field because I work in infectious disease. So, um, Nowadays, uh, it's really uh, recognized and known that pathogens can regulate ferroptosis. Some of the pathogens uh, inhibit ferroptosis and some of them induces ferroptosis. Uh, and by different ways and different uh, and, and having different targets. And here I just brought the, I mean the list of pathogens. Uh, that are known to induce uh, to regulate ferroptotic pathway. And I'm gonna concentrate in, in, in mycobacterium tuberculosis because uh, this uh, was our contribution for uh, to the field. Um, and, and that's the pathogen I've been working for uh, almost uh, 18 years. So as you may know, tuberculosis is uh, induced by mycobacterium tuberculosis and uh, its spread is, uh, uh, MTB is transmitted by uh, aerosol uh, droplets containing the bacilli. And when MTB uh, reaches the lungs, it will infect ovular macrophages, which later on will die and release uh, uh, the pathogen that now will be able to infect uh, other cells. This will induce a huge inflammatory response that later on will be important for uh, the formation of the granuloma, which is an important structure to, con to avoid uh, bacterial dissemination to other organs. However, one third of, uh, of the empty being infected uh, people will develop active disease and they eventually they, they, and they can die. So in TB, the way of how uh, infected myeloid cells die, mainly macrophage, is uh, uh, important to determine uh, disease progression. So uh, as I showed you before, uh, ap apoptosis and necrosis. So in the case of TB, apoptosis, which is induced by a virulent mycobacteria, is known as, as good for a host because controls um, uh, um, mycobacterial infection 
through a process known as aphorocytosis. On the other hand, uh, necrosis, which is induced by virulent mycobacteria, is characterized by the loss of plasma membrane integrity, leading to, to, to release uh, uh, to mycobacteria escape to extracellular milieu and also release of dams. So that's why tissue necrosis has been uh, um, considered as a potential target for host direct therapy in tuberculosis. So in 2009, um, we came with this concept that ferroptosis uh, can play a role in, in MTB infection. And this was because we saw a major feature of ferroptosis induced uh, uh, during, uh, uh, in macrophages uh, after MTB infection, such as reduced glutathione and GPX4 expression, along with increased uh, intracellular free iron mitochondrial superoxides and the lipid peroxidation. And importantly, when we treated uh, this uh, infected cultures with lipid peroxidation or iron chelation, we could suppress this form of death. Last year, we decided to uh, look at uh, 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 using genetic approach the, uh, to uh, uh, the importance of GPX4 in, in, in modulating uh, uh, MTB induced uh, necrosis. So, um, here, when we stratify patients, uh, uh, TB patients based on disease severity, we found that that TB that that the TB patients displaying severe pathologies, uh, uh, they sh they showed reduced glutathione uh, um, along with increased uh, lipid peroxidation. So suggesting that glutathione metabolic pathway is important for, to determine uh, disease progression uh, in TB patients. So in vivo, we decided to look to, to, to target GPX4 by depleting GPX4 in, in the hematopoietic compartment, and then we did infection. So as we can see here, mice deficient in GPX4, they die faster compared to the wild type. And when we look at the lungs of these animals, we found a widespread necrosis going on. Uh, and this necrosis was associated with increased bacterial loads in both lungs and spleens compared to the wild type. So uh, we also crossed GPX4, uh, we also depleted GPX4 in a myeloid compartment uh, and also in, in macrophage specifically. And we showed that when we depleted GPX4 in this, uh, in this uh, myeloid compartment, we see a lowered frequency and numbers of ovular macrophages following MTB infection. Um, and also GPX4 deficient macrophages, they were uh, um, sensitive to undergo uh, ferroptosis. And, uh, uh, and we know that because when we treated cells with uh, ferrostatin, which is the liperoxidation inhibitor, we now see that uh, we could suppress the, uh, uh, this, uh, this form of, of necrosis. However, thinking about host direct therapy, although we saw that GPX4 is important to regulate host resistance to MTB infection uh, through the regulation of cell death, uh, GPX4 represents a poor uh, therapeutic target because its depletion or inhibition uh, results in worst uh, improved disease outcome and not uh, worst and not improved uh, disease outcome. So that's why we start to think about pathways that would uh, control GPX4 and glutathione met metabolic pathway and serve as an alternative target for um, preventing uh, necrosis. So when we're talking about oxidative stress response, the first molecule that shows up in the literature is NERV2. So as I mentioned before, NERV2 is a, is a transcription factor that is found bound to keep you one in the cytosol in the st in steady state. Under stress conditions, ROS breaks the binding be between KP1 and NERV2, allowing NERV2 to translocate into the nucleus and then induce a bunch of antioxidant genes, genes that are important for uh, controlling uh, glutathione uh, and iron metabolic pathway, for example. However, there is another transcription factor called BAC1, which I mentioned before. So BAC1 
suppress nerve two by competing uh, uh, for the same promoter and then block the uh, antioxidant gene induction. So basically we thought that maybe if we block back one, this will boost nerve two activation and, and we'll see more uh, upregulation of pro-antioxidant uh, gene related genes and maybe less uh, necrosis, less ferroptosis. So that's what uh, we started to do. And Kate, she was my student here at NIH and she was interested to understand how macrophages die in response to RNA overload. So here there is no infection. She incubate bone marrow direct macrophage with iron donor. And, and, and she look at uh, uh, the survival, the, the viability of this co uh, the cells in this culture 24 hours later. So as you can see here by flow cytometry, uh, uh, when we see high, uh, high staining for life, that means that the cells are undergoing uh, necrosis. And that actually what's happening in the cell that we're uh, 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 stimulated with RM. So she started to see death of these cells. However, when she, when she look at the cultures of macrophages deficient in back one, now she sees that the cells are not more resistant to this iron-induced form of death. And this was associated with, uh, and this protection was associated with reduced uh, lipid peroxidation. So we decided to look at back one expression in TB patients, um, and then in collaboration with Bruno Andrade in Brazil and Tony Scriba in Cape Town, we could look at back one expression two different cohorts. So uh, as we can see here, uh, active TB patients in both cohorts show increased back one expression compared to the health controls, suggesting that back one is playing a role in, in, in determining disease progression uh, in, uh, in this disease. So we also look at uh, this special localization of back one in the granuloma in, in monkeys infected with MTB and also in these uh, uh, mice um, called uh, SST1S animal, which uh, uh, develop granuloma-like in, 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 in the lungs. So in both cases, we see uh, stronger staining for a back one in the center of the granuloma. And, and this ex stronger expression correlates with uh, uh, overlap areas in that cells are undergoing necrosis. So to evaluate if BAC1 is important for inducing necrosis, we infected uh, black six mice and BAC1 deficient mice at, uh, at high dose MTB to be able to see necrosis in irregular black six animals. And a month, uh, about a month, uh, we look at uh, CFU and tissue necrosis in these animals. So as we can see here, back one deficient mice, they are um, more resistant to high dose MTB infection. And here is the uh, media, median of, of death of, of survival of these animals. So Y type animals, they usually die by day 34 uh, as average. And, and the back one mice, they die, they start to die uh, 180 days. So it's a huge protection. In terms of bacterial loads, we see less uh, bugs in, uh, uh, in the lungs and spleens compared to the white type. In terms of, of tissue damage, uh, tissue necrosis, we used this approach in which we inject in vivo um, uh, this dye that binds to a valuable DNA. So in this case, this dye binds to a DNA outside the cells and also inside of, the, uh, of necrotic cells. And we can use as a, as a readout for necrosis in the tissue. So here is not a lung section, it's a total uh, a whole lung imaging. And as expected, we see a huge staining for, for uh, cytox green, which suggests that these animals uh, develop necrosis. However, when we image the lungs uh, from the back one deficient mice, we see a huge drop in, in cytox green staining, suggesting that uh, 
these animals are more resistant to MTB-induced uh, necrosis. So uh, because we, we also found that um, back one deficient mice, they had more glutathione, more GTX4 expression, and less lipid peroxidation in, 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 in myeloid cells. We want to understand if the uh, ferroptotic uh, uh, Proptose related genes were uh, regulated um, in, in, in cells from, from in, in the app, in, in cells deficient in BAC1. So we chose these um, uh, numbers of genes that are known to play a role in, in, in proptosis, and we stratify those genes based on uh, uh, its uh, role in induction of proptosis or. Uh, uh, suppression of this pathway. And by single cell sequencing, we uh, look at uh, this gene profiling in, in, in cells deficient in BAC1 and in wild type. So as you can see here, we couldn't see any difference in terms of genes that are uh, known to induce ferroptosis. So basically, MTB is able to induce ferroptosis even in the absence of BAC1. But why we see less cell death in this case? So when we look at genes that are associated with protection against ferroptosis, we see now that um, BAC1 uh, deficient cells, they have upregulation of these genes, suggesting um, that most of the genes uh, 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 most of the cells um, deficient in back one, they are now protected to undergo ferroptosis, uh, uh, except for uh, T cell, B cells, NK cells, and DCs. In, the, in this case, we don't see any change because basically these cells, they don't express uh, high levels of back one, for example. So maybe that's why we don't see regu uh, rolling regulation of, of this uh, proptotic uh, associated uh, gene profiling uh, protection. So then we come back to the beginning that we, we have to um, understand better uh, how these different forms of, of cell death, they are regulated. And the case of ferroptosis is still a uh, uh, closed box because we still need to understand um, how this pathway can interact with other um, cell death um, pathways like paraptosis and uh, necroptosis and, and, and how we could specifically target uh, uh, the cell death uh, modality to induce and to better induce and, and, and or inhibit um, um, uh, this, this, this pathway, basically. So I would like to thank uh, all of my collaborators uh, at NIH in Brazil, um, in South Africa, and also in Japan that contribute for uh, the study which I showed to you uh, uh, related to uh, MTB infection. And thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Edu. Edu, absolutely great, great. really. Great. Thank you. Brilliant. It's an excellent, uh, very comprehensive overview and your work is astonishing. So you're doing oh, thank you. really great. We wish you decided to come here and establish a lab here in Brazil. Yeah, <laughs> it's a possibility. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's wait for the next. We have, uh, we have open a position in, uh, in uh, our department very soon. We will, you know, I'll be a pleasure. Uh, advertise. So let's join Diego again. Yeah. <laughs> It was really good work. And uh, take Sylvia to me again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with the, the students. Andrew. Hello, Professor. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, very interesting. 
Um, so um, my, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is, uh, some people are more prone to development, some deficiency of iron, uh, uh, anemic persons, right? like uh, uh, cancer patients, they are more prone to development uh, iron deficiency. Uh, do you believe that these persons uh, are uh, resistant or more susceptible to uh, ferroptosis? So it depends. Um, I, I'm not familiar with, uh, uh, with the literature in cancer, um, but when you say deficient in iron means deficient uh, this deficiency is intracellularly or in in the blood, for example. In the blood, in the blood. Okay, so uh, there are actually several issues here. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in, in in some of of, of tumor cells, um, uh, the cells start to express high levels of transferrin. So this is going to sequest uh, most of the iron that is um, can be found in the circulation basically and this will keep iron intracellularly so it's a huge chance that it, they i mean it they are anemic so they see less uh, iron uh, free iron or not free iron but iron in their circulation because this iron is um, accumulated inside the cells so uh, that's why they they are considering ferroptose as a target for uh, uh, cancer therapy, because these cells, they do have tons of iron, and we know that iron is important for growth, like for cell proliferation, for example, important for um, uh, uh, cell function, basically. Um, but if you bring down the levels of gl glutathione or, or antioxidant response, these cells now, they can die quickly. So it's a balance basically. So you have to understand, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with uh, the literature, if uh, in these patients that they, they show they are anemic, if their cells, they have or not accumulation of iron. I would think uh, that they might have more iron intracellularly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Thanks. so I would expect that uh, probably this patient will, will be more, more susceptible. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, uh, do, it, uh, do you believe that interferon type 1 uh, is down-regulating the CLC3A2 and CLC7A11 in lupus? That's a... Uh... Actually, that's actually, yeah, that's, that's, that's what actually that paper showed. Um, yeah. That type 1 interferon uh, activates this transcription factor called CREN alpha, uh -huh. and CREN alpha blocks the induction of GPX4. So basically, type 1 interferon can block directly the induction of GPX4. In the case of, 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 of BAC1 scenario, uh, I saw that when we treat cells in TB, when we treat cells with type 1 interferon, we see upregulation of BAC1. So mm -hmm. basically, type 1 can modulate um, uh, these uh, ferroptotic pathway by different ways and by different, uh, 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 inducing different pathways. But yeah, in lupus, they, they found that type 1 is, is uh, important for bringing down the levels of GPX4, in, which in this case is important for uh, lupus progression due to neutrophil ferroptosis. Thank you. So, Hugo? Uh, thanks, teacher, uh, professor, for the great presentation. Uh, it was really, really great. Um, I have uh, two questions, too. Uh, my first question, it's about the pos positive control to ferroptosis. Uh, if I understood very well your presentation, um, it's really complicated to exist a uh, target, really, really good target for ferroptosis. But in the same time, different papers, um, 
even the, the early papers explore to study the ferroptosis use a ferrothacine and a lipro liproxacine with mm -hmm. inhibitors to ferroptosis and mm -hmm. use these drugs with positive controls. Do you think uh, is it it's something uh, good to use uh, to positive controls or it's important to explore more to exist others? That's my first question. Uh, the second question, it's about the, the balance to any RF2 and batch one. Um, if I understood your presentation, in general, there is a competition for uh, for the genes and the and antioxidant response. So mm -hmm. always exist this competition. It's or uh, how can I say that? The stimulation to any RF2 or back one, or it's possible exist a, a coexistence of the two uh, molecules acting on the genes. I'm not sure if it was clear, but... Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay, so uh, for the first question, um, you said uh, positive regulation of apoptosis uh, using uh, ferrostatin or lipostatin. Um, actually, it's not a positive regulation. It's a negative. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I say um, positive. It's negative. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Ferrostatin is... is, is yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Because, <laughs> I switch. Um, uh, this guy, so we have to think about uh, ferroptosis as a um, failure of the cells to detoxify lip, uh, oxidized lipids, basically. So all the time our cells are undergoing ferroptosis, but we also have this antioxidant response that all the time are trying to damp uh, this uh, pro-oxidant um, uh, molecules, right? Pro-oxidant pathway. So when we lose the ability to control that response, that's when we have ferroptosis. It's, it's totally different from uh, paraptosis and necroptosis that actually you have molecules that needs to be activated, need to be activated to have the induction of the pathway. Here, it's like the pathway is on all the time and but we, we have guys that are trying to prevent the, the, that pathway. So uh, that's why uh, they were using uh, ferrostatin and, and, for example, uh, and vitamin E as uh, potential, uh, like uh, iron chelator as well, as a negative, uh, uh, as compound that negative, uh, that 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 brings down that inhibit uh, uh, ferroptosis. So um, uh, so yeah. So that your question was uh, but, but, if they could the use these compounds to uh, cross regulation between. Uh, oh yeah, the batch one and and nerf two. Uh, yeah. So uh, the cross regulation between back one and and nerf two. Yeah, so, um, so uh, most of the time, yeah, so BAC1 is known to, to suppress uh, nerve 2 okay? However, BAC1 does a lot of stuff as well. So BAC1 also regulates, uh, for example, another transcription factor, which is called uh, CEBP alpha and beta, that are also important for the induction of antioxidant genes in the absence of, of nerf 2 for example. So, um, but but you ask me if they they, they can coexist in the same um, compart cell compartment. Yes, they can. Um, but when you have nerf 2 and BAC1, so usually you have BAC1 in the nucleus and nerf 2 in the cytosol. So when you have cell stress, you have the translocation of nerf 2 but BAC1 is there. So there is something that actually inhibits back one at the beginning of, of this oxidative stress response, which is heme. So our cells get heme, okay, intracellularly. Heme binds to back one and removes back one and inhibits back one. So, and remove them uh, back one uh, from the nucleus into the cytosol. So then this will allow nerve to, to bind to the promoter and then induce this bunch of antioxidant genes. However, one of the genes that, back one, that nerve 2 induces is hemoxygenase. And hemoxygenase 
degrades him. So he, so in that case, the lower levels of him in the cytosol will allow nerve two to go back to the nucleus and block, uh, and consequently block uh, uh, nerve two activity again. So that's the balance. So all the time, our cells they have this back one and the switch on and off uh, for back one and nerve two, and that's why the time point we look. Uh, for this activation is critical because at the beginning, I would expect to see more nerve two activation and later on, uh, I would see uh, less nerve two activation. So definitely um, uh, they can coexist, but not in the same promoter. Thank you so much, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you. Marceli? So thank you, Professor, for your presentation. I have a basic question. If we have ROS metabolism activity, always the cell death will be by ferroptosis or uh, not? That's a good question. Um, it depends. So there are um, new pathways uh, that I, I think was in 2018 or 19, I can remember that uh, they came and they called this form of death as um, oxytosis, if I'm not wrong. Uh, oxytosis, this was 2018. So uh, oxy oxytosis uh, was uh, described in that paper as a oxidative stress mediated form of death. However, later on, they uh, look at actually this uh, oxytosis uh, is actually ferroptosis. So um, all the time, so some, sometimes, I mean, there are some reviews after uh, 2018 that actually says ferroptosis slash oxytosis because of this relationship, uh, I mean, between um, these two. It's a very interesting uh, question and uh, the answer is um, most, but not all of them. And uh, depends on the condition. And of course, uh, it is a very hard question because ROS yeah. actually is involved in the induction of parptosis and also exactly. apoptosis. Yeah. So uh, it depends on the cell type and depends on the, the amounts of the ROS and it depends on the connection uh, between other signals and cells. So it, it is uh, very difficult to say that always yeah. be one type of cell death or another it type or a cross-talk among them. So that is a that's, very- That's one, yeah, that's one important point. point. Uh, yeah, that's one important point uh, <laughs> that Karina uh, uh, brought us now. I mean, because people don't see, I mean, there's like few papers trying to investigate the cross-talking between those two pathways. And clearly I agree with, with Karina because everything depends on the, the levels you have, right? So you can you can have ROS, I mean, playing role in, in different uh, cell death modalities, but if this is associated with iron overload, then you see ferroptosis. If this is associated with uh, um, uh, other like, RIP kinase three activation, ML activation, uh, this is uh, gonna see uh, necroptosis going on. Um, it's really tricky. It's really tricky. Uh, people say that uh, lipid peroxidation will be the best marker. And there are some cartoons that actually show uh, that some of the path like paraptosis, you don't see lipid peroxidation happening. And, and this is not like 100% true because you can see lipid peroxidation happening, but again, everything depends on the levels and, 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 and the trigger you have. And there is a paper uh, uh, published in 2018 on cell host microbes that they used uh, sepsis as a model for um, paraptosis. So they saw that uh, there is a crosstalking between 
Phoroptotic pathway and paroptotic pathway, and this is regulated by GPX4. So basically, when they depleted GPX4 in, in this um, model, they saw more caspase 1 and 11 activation, more gas dermine T, and, and, and the animals uh, died quickly. But when they treated these mice with uh, vitamin E, if I'm not wrong, which is a lipid peroxidation inhibitor. So this improved um, uh, uh, the disease. So, so the mice, they, they did not die quickly, uh, basically. So, and, and later on they found that actually, but that one was not like um, formally show, but the concept is, is good that um, the areas in which uh, the lipids uh, undergo uh, oxidation on, on, on the membranes are, is a, basically the area that because cleavage gardamine D makes poor. So it makes totally sense that these two pathways could be working together at the same time. Um, yeah, so it's not a specific uh, 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 ROS in this case. So that's why I, I, I mentioned when how to determine phoroptosis. It's a combination of parameters. There is no one single component. You have to, you have to look at what's going on in general to see if you do have or not. Thank you. Natalia. Hi, Professor. Thank you for the amazing lecture. So if I understood right, phoroptosis is mainly defined by this membrane description. Yeah. But you said in the beginning that are other morphological modifications that we can define phoroptosis. So mm -hmm. these other morphological modifications are also caused by holes and iron. It's the same cause that alters others, that makes other alterations in the cell. Sorry, uh, can you say again, uh, what, is, what, what is the question? So uh, if... If the features of paroptosis is caused by uh, 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 iron accumulation and uh, rust. Yes, so that's a combination. So all the time when you have increased our, uh, uh, iron uh, concentration in intracellularly free iron, okay? Uh, loss of antioxidant response, which in this case is um, glutathione levels or GPX4 activity, uh, along with in, um, increased mitochondrial superoxide and, and lip peroxidation, you can use those uh, three as a marker of ferroptosis. But I think Natalia means, for example, because uh, in the case of fructosis, we can see also the uh, smaller mitochondria mm -hmm. and uh, so nuclear uh, condensation, uh, not uh, chromatin condensation, but nuclear yeah. features. Wow. And the, all these uh, characteristics, all these features are caused by, by iron and ROS. Because I understand Caused that by lipid peroxidation. Because, uh, yeah, lipid peroxidation. You have the the yeah. cell damage, then some membrane damage, and uh, these yeah. other. So yeah, it's a lipid peroxidation also, ha also happening in the mitochondria, in the lysosomes. Like lysosomes are like a bomb, you know. Uh, we have like tons of iron in the lysosome. So if you do have leakage of uh, in the in the lysosome uh, of the lysosomes you're gonna release tons of iron in the cytosol and the cells cannot handle that because there is no enough uh, antioxidant to, to bring uh, this is kind of stress that will be induced by, by, by iron. So yeah, it's, it's a damage, basically lipid peroxidation will, will, will induce these uh, mitochondrial chains and other, and also in other organelles as well. Okay, thank oh, you. Oh, sorry. So there is actually a paper, a beautiful, beautiful paper showing um, that um, ER stress is uh, one of the major components in, in regulating uh, ferroptosis. Uh, 
So if you have ER stress, you're gonna see fructosis uh, uh, going on. But again, we have to think about combination because ER stress is involved in a bunch of stuff as well. Thank you, Natalia. Michel? Thank you, Professor, for your presentation. My question is about sickle cell disease. Patients with sickle cell disease can develop iron overload and cardiac dysfunction. Is this cardiomyopathy associated with fructosis? And if so, could be the inhibition of fructosis uh, a, a way to reduce this cardiac, cardiac damage? Yeah, so I'm not familiar with that disease specific, specifically, but there are papers uh, using uh, animal models that develop um, this kind of pathology in, in the heart tissue. And they see that actually this is associated with um, um, uh, iron. Uh, when they uh, treated these uh, mice with uh, DFO, our incubator, they see a reduction in terms of tissue damage. Um, and also uh, there is a paper public, published in 2020 showing that um, back one deficient mice, they are more resistant, resistant to this kind of pathology. So, yeah, so probably uh, these patients, there is a huge chance that fructose may play a role in, in that kind of pathology as well. So, Lucas, I'm enjoying this participation, the student uh, participation. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> well, hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I've got lots of questions, actually. Some of them were kind of answered, but I still got um, some questions to, to ask. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, um, I saw on some of the results you, you showed from the, the papers that uh, the, GMS, the GMSO was also at the bars were, were, were also high along with the treatment and I know that a lot of um, the treatment um, whether it's um, inducers or inhibitors they are diluted in DM cell and my question was like and I'm asking that because I also work with fructosis and I know I've seen that um, DM cell can be really um, a bugger <laughs> and it can be really hard to deal with because we never know if the results we're seeing that if, 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 if what we're seeing it's actually due to the MSL or the treatment itself. Some of the results you showed I saw there the bars were also high for GM cell and my question is um, if you faced it as well if you've seen it as well if you've or if you you, you haven't it, or if it's just me <laughs> dealing with that um, but it's something I also look at when I'm when I'm seeing um, anything related to that um, okay so first of all I'm trying to look at the presentation again to see um, what what kind of readout you're um, okay, so DMSO. Uh, DMSO is toxic, yes. uh, right? So you have to be careful. So they used. So I think I think yeah. maybe the, the original paper. So the original paper, they they used DMSO as control, right? Uh, for the compounds they used to induce fructosis, right? So arestin is um, diluted in 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 DMSO. So you have to be careful with the concentration you keep your cells in the meso. So in this case, you have to dilute your compound in a concentration that will not hurt your cells. Because if you, if you dilute your compound like and keep uh, in a concentration 
that when you add your culture, you're going to have 10% of the MSO there. For sure, your cells will die. And for sure, you're going to induce ROS, you're going to induce, I mean, a bunch of stuff. And the cells will die quickly. So you have to keep a very, very low concentration. So we usually, when I dilute my, my compounds, I keep them as like a like thousand fold concentrate because when I do the dilution in my culture, that little amount of the MSO will not affect the viability or will trigger any, any, any kind of activation of that, macro, of that cell. Yeah, well, usually so basically to, the MSO to here, here uses a control. Sorry, say again. I'm sorry. No, you can, you can, you can keep. Uh, so yeah. Sorry. So basically, the DMSO, uh, I agree with you, can induce a bunch of stuff, but depends on the concentration you use, and it's important in this case because you're working with compounds that are diluted in 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 DMSO. So that's why they they do have DMSO as a control. Yeah, uh, my, my question was because some of, of the um, graphs you showed, it was um, like a treatment with lip lipoxetine and li li lipoxetine. And it was a control only with GMSL. And the bars were like at the same height, almost. And uh, it caught my attention. And um, about the, the, the concentration of GMSL, um, do you keep it like 1%, less than 1%? Much less. Yeah, no, 1% is actually a lot. <laughs> you have to okay. be like as a like minimum. 0 0.1. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Four, zero one, in zero one. One. so as okay. I said, so I, I usually, I, yeah, I usually I, I do my dilution like a thousand times. You know, just to avoid any interference with uh, the MSO in my culture. Otherwise, you're gonna mess. You're gonna uh, mess with your your results. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm doing in in vivo treatment, so for me it was really hard because I had to. Oh, you're delete. saying in vivo? In vivo yeah. is different. No, also also in vitro, both and both for me. Uh, you know, it's easier to do it in vitro, of course. Uh -huh. But um. Yeah, and uh, but yeah, I don't know if you if you found the graph I, I was talking about, but it, it, it's not about the graph itself. It's about Demosol and how problematic it is. It's been to me. Um, um, my um, second question goes to the same direction, which is. Um, Usually, uh, these in inhibitors and inducers, they have to be diluted in dimisol because they are very hydrophobic. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't keep them in dimisol, as we just mentioned. Uh, we have to dilute them in um, PBS, water, or medium, depending on what you're working with. Yeah. And when I tried to do it, it just became a mess because... Uh, they separated, uh, like the, the drugs, they, 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 they phase separate immediately, immediately. And, and then I try to uh, do some gentle warming and bulk, bulk vortex. I try to do lots of things and it hardly works. And do you have any advice? <laughs> yeah, so you... in vitro, I haven't <laughs> seen something like that. So, and it usually happens when you have, and you're, when you have like high concentration of the compound, for example, uh, usually uh, the highest um, concentration of first, uh, let me see first, yeah, of first I used uh, in vitro was 10 micromolar. At 10 micromolar, you don't see any of this kind of problem. If you go higher, yeah, you're gonna see, and definitely this will kill your cells. Um, uh, in vitro, in vivo, because we have to dilute it, as you said, in PBS or whatever to inject, usually you uh, this these compounds they precipitate. So in that case, you have to dilute in a special uh, vehicle, which is a um, PEG. So uh, if you have a chance, take a look on my uh, paper. 
published in 2019. And, and there I specified uh, uh, the vehicle I used for uh, delivering uh, first heading. And this is very tricky because most of the, page, uh, the papers, they don't describe that really well. And I just realized when I was doing like you, diluting high concentration of parastatin, I mean, everything started like to precipitate. So um, <laughs> yeah. uh, was like tour, you know, was not, not like uh, properly reconstituted. So um, you have, I'm mean, just like open here because I, I can remember uh, the concentration I used. Um, just a second. So, why are you are looking for it? Uh, do there's something that uh, you can people use as well is to dilute this hydrophobic. Uh, yeah. So bag, bag olive is oil, high grade olive oil. Or I, I haven't done in in a in like in corn oil or whatever. But I what I've done is um it's in PEG. So I used like three mi milligrams per kilograms of ferrostatin. So it's a lot um, in 40% uh, PEG. So polyethylene glycol 400 and 0.3% of DMSO. So the concentration of DMSO is very low and I delivered. So I, I didn't inject uh, in PBS, for example, I inject in PEG. 40%, that's, that's the tricky part about uh, ferrostatin. So if you inject in PPS, well, you, you will not see any effect of the, of the drug. And of course, your control should be bag 40%, 0.3% uh, of the MSO without the drug. And another thing, uh, if you, you, yes. learn, you cannot inject, uh, uh, you, you cannot um, do um, long-term treatment with PEG because PEG by itself is toxic. So if you do like daily injection, uh, the maximum I've done was um, uh, 13 days. And I, I've seen like paper showing if you do like uh, 20, 30 days, uh, this can, uh, PEG by itself will affect uh, the mice. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you. I've been it. Um, can I ask just 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 another one? Okay. The final one. <laughs> Sorry. Because okay? we are uh, late. Ten okay. minutes late, and we I'm have sorry. Yeah. More it's... questions here. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, well, um, the other one is just um, it's a bigger one. Um, you know, there are uh, more than one. They are in GPX for independent pathways. Mm -hmm. And um, it it got my attention because it's phreptosis is usually related to GPX4 as the major antioxidant pathway. So almost all the drugs and and treatment they are focused on trying to um, inhibit or downregulate uh, GPX4 activity. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, um, if there are other ways to, to deal with, um, with, the, um, with the accumulation of lipid peroxides, is it enough? Is it really enough to only focus on that pathway? And to that, I also like to talk about iron independent um, uh, li lipid peroxidation because there are other um, oxidant agents besides iron. Mm -hmm. And so that can be lipid peroxidation in the cell, regardless of the accumulation of iron. Mm -hmm. And we know very well that cryptosis is in the end basically lipid peroxidation. In the end, I know there, are, there is a pathway, there is iron accumulation, the, the, the down regulation of the antioxidant pathway, but in the end, what really happens is lipid peroxidation. Yeah. So 
my question is it's because I fear that people might get to me right there. In the end, if fructosis is death by lipid peroxidation, aren't we just looking for it, it doesn't it put fructosis under the, the definition of fructosis under question? Because lipid peroxidation can happen regardless of the accumulation of iron. And so it's like I, I wanted to separate the intrinsic and the extrinsic um, apoptosis pathways and separate them by different cell, uh, cell death types. When actually they are the same, they can be tr triggered by different uh, ways. Necrosis can happen, can be triggered in different ways. So isn't, is, could fructosis be questioned in a way that it's simply a way, one of the ways, of the possible ways to trigger lipid peroxidation and not actually a valid cell death type? Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not uh, because it's very to, clear. You know, I'm not trying to. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very clear the importance of iron to trigger this pathway. Okay, so it's, uh, I mean, there are several papers showing that if you don't have iron, you don't see um, lipid peroxidation, right? Uh, however, however, I agree with you. I don't know if this is the right term. and. I, I'm not the person who's gonna change the name, but I've seen like a lot of uh, papers and myself as well. I, I I would prefer to say to define this form of death as a lipid peroxidation mediated form of death, or oxidative stress the mediated necrosis, instead defining for optosis, cupoptosis, oxytosis, or whatever, because that's actually what's happening. So the cells are dying due to the, this huge accumulation and loss of, uh, of lipid peroxide and associated with loss of control of the host antioxidant response. So that's why I feel that. So the name of fructosis came because the major findings was when you chelate iron, you see inhibition of that. But I, I, I I agree with you in, in, in some point that actually we should um, maybe make, I mean, I mean, open the box and then say, okay, so let's try to think about um, lipid peroxidation mediated form of death instead, uh, one, one specific um, yeah. molecule, like um, cuproptosis, which is induced by Cooper. It's, I mean, the principle is quite similar. So imagine how many micronutrients we have. So we're going to have like different names for each micronutrient. Mm -hmm. So yes. it's possible that in 10 years, people are going to realize, okay, so maybe we should say uh, micronutrients induced form of death or leap peroxidation induced to death or oxidative stress induced to death. So um I agree with you. I think in the future, probably uh, we will try to uh, the field, mm -hmm. try to uh, compact and then find like a, a name, exactly name for that. But right yeah. now, peroptosis is uh, the the one that actually people are adopting to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And, that, and, and, and that's why, like in my papers now, I'm avoiding add peroptosis in the title. <laughs> because of that issue because I, I i do believe that actually is more than that. yeah yeah I, I really love studying it as well and this question is genuine it's because i fear that in the future it might be a huge question for me to answer and mm -hmm. i'm already trying to step up um, yeah. um thank you very much and i'm sorry for, you for question. So long. <laughs> okay Abolaji. Okay, um, thank you very much for this presentation and the answer. Some of my questions have been uh, answered already, but I will just ask this. Yeah, uh, my question is on GPX4. Mm -hmm. 
because I'm trying to consider the good and the bad side of this uh, GPX4 because at a point you mentioned that GPX4 can inhibit um, lipid ROX and then with this is going to inhibit ferroptosis. Mm -hmm. And also if GPX4 is active, there will not be uh, dead signals and the cell can also survive. Then thirdly, you mentioned that GPX4 induce ferroptosis in uh, neutrophil, which can also lead to lupus. No, it's the opposite. It's so the opposite. GPX4 controls ferroptosis. If you remove, so in the case of the lupus, okay, so having GPX4 is good, pay for your cells. No matter if I'm talking about cancer, it's good for the cell per se. Why? Because GPX4 will bring down the concentration of lipid peroxides on biological membranes, and this will be important for keeping cell alive, okay? If you remove GPX4 from the system, you will see uh, ferroptosis because of the, the higher concentration of lipid peroxidation. In the case of lupus, um, the animals, they develop lupus because they do have lower, lowered uh, uh, levels of, of GPX4. So they were deficient in GPX4. And then neutrophils, they died quickly. And that's why they developed lupus. Okay. All right. Thank you. So if this is uh, with them, I was just thinking if there's a way we can upregulate Know, the expression of this GPX4 to induce ferroptosis and then we have more so survivor. Or what do you think? Sorry, uh, can you repeat your question? Your second question? Yeah, that if GPX4 actually plays this uh, beneficial you know, in the cell, in the body system, is there a way to uh, increase the expression that upregulates the expression of GPX1. Yeah, so that's so in, in let's keep in lupus. So that's the, the thing they're uh, thinking right now. So, and it, if the case is uh, that type 1 interference bring down the levels of GPX4 in neutrophils, and that's why cells are uh, uh, dying through uh, for apoptosis, they think we could. Uh, think here will be try to um, uh, bring down the signals that actually it's important for uh, uh, inhibiting GPX4. So in this case, it will be like um, inhibit uh, type 1 interference signaling. That's one possibility. Another possibility will be inducing, uh, boosting the host antioxidant response. In this case, uh, uh, induce more expression, uh, more activity of NERF2. In, in that case, we will see more induction of genes associated with antioxidant response. Um, and and the, that paper I showed in which they used a BAC1 deficient mice. So in, uh, they saw that actually that was, was good in terms of, of controlling disease progression. And this was because in the absence of BAC1, you're gonna have more NERF2 activity and with more NERF2 activity, we'll have better control of a neutrophil's death. So yes, so basically uh, you'll sometimes you'll not be able to in modulate the induction of GPX4 per se, but you can try to, to understand better the pathway to target this, this, this condition. So you can do upstream or downstream regulation of GPX4. Thank you. Samsung. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Professor, for this um, wonderful presentation. So uh, I, I have a quick question. Okay, so in the beginning, you mentioned the um, ferroptosis as one of the types of regulated cell death, right? Um, which is caspase independent, right? And um, from our lectures yesterday and from what I've read, 
I know that <coughs> apoptosis are like um, a form of beneficial um, effect in the body, like embryonic development, cell development. So I was thinking, okay, if peroptosis also is a form of regulated cell, can it have can it have a kind of physiological relevance in the body, just like apoptosis? Mm -hmm. So GPX for full knockout is little, so they don't they die before the birth. So we suggest that GPX4 and fructotic pathway is playing role in, in, in regulating development as well. So uh, that's why I had to use GPX4 flux animals to be able to study to, to understand better this pathway, uh, this molecule uh, in vivo. So uh, to be honest with you, when I was generating these animals, I thought that, that like when I was depleting GPX4 in the in the myeloid compartment, I would expect to see like huge depletion of, of macrophages, for example, or neutrophils or whatever in, in, in naive animals. And it was a surprise that actually there is no change in, in macrophages. What I see is that these macrophages, they were, um, they, they were more stressed. So they had more lipid peroxidation. They had more um, 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 lip, lip peroxidation and mitochondrial superoxide, but they were alive. One possibility that we discussed in the paper is uh, due to um, uh, the regulation of of the cell death in this case, in, uh, induced by um, GPX4 independent pathways like FSP1. Uh, when we do infection, when we did the infection in these animals, so we add one extra um, stress to the cells, and then the cells die quickly. So um, GPX4 is important as well, but uh, I think the importance of GPX4 and apoptosis for the development is probably different, um, but it's very clear that these animals, they die before the birth. Okay. okay, all right, thank you. So Hinata? Uh, <clears throat> hello. Uh uh, my question is, uh, I'm going to summarize it because of the time. Uh, can I differentiate between um, necroptosis, oh, um, necroptosis, feroptosis, and necrosis morphologically in P53 uh, white type cells with particular stress? Good question. I don't know. Probably. Uh, you have to take a look on the mitochondria to see uh, if there is any change in terms of mitochondrial. Um, um, okay. I would say that in the feroptosis, uh, you'll see is more of a dense uh, and 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 uh, size of the, the the mitochondria, which is not common in the other forms of death. So, uh, yeah, but I, I don't know in the case of P53, I can remember. White type cells, uh, because you say that for uh, proptosis to occur, you have to have P53, P53, I'm sorry, in one of the papers you show that. Oh, okay. So in that paper, they show that if you don't have P53, P53 oh. You, you have you're gonna have uh, accumulation of of uh, you're gonna have increased levels of system nex, which will be important for higher production of glutathione, and those cells will be more resistant. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. So okay. if you do have white type fifty three and and have a stress uh, in that condition. Yes. So the cells will be sensitized to undergo feroptosis if you induce feroptosis. Yeah, uh, the reticular stress, I think, was induced by um, the knockdown of uh, transcriptive, transcription factor, TBX2, and the and anoikis. 
That's the lack of attachment mm -hmm. on epithelial cells. Yeah. So, uh, but as we said, so ER stress, so ER stress has, has been shown to play an important role in, in, um, in, in ferroptosis as well, but I don't know if this is will be specific to the, to the pathway, but it's important. Okay. Can I just add, uh, Renata, by, if you look at all these uh, guideline papers of the nomenclature committee that Lorenzo, you know, captain, you will see that uh, you need more than one assay to characterize any uh, yes, form I of that. So, yes, once I mean. you, so once you characterize, then you can use whatever it's easy for you to do some quantification and uh, yeah. in, in the system. So not even for apoptosis, if it's something new and it's apoptosis, you should show by three, four, you know, uh, methods, including morphology and uh, biochemistry. Gen -ed, genetic regulation and so on, yes. Yeah, so that's why it's very tricky to say specific because it's, I mean, it's not specific, you know? So you, you see, I mean, when you have the death, when you induce the death, you're gonna see, but uh, it's very- I saw, I saw a lot of types of death. I saw, I saw uh, necroptosis and I saw uh, apoptosis too. So I was, I never asked myself if ferroptosis could happen in this case. So, Maybe I should answer that with morphology and other types of biochemistry. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have to have more parameters. And also you use yes. the drug that inhibit lipid peroxidation. If in your condition, you, you treat your cells and you see um, uh, less death. So it's possible that you have ferroptosis as one of the pathways that is induced in your culture. And I'm telling you that because uh, I think that um, when we have some kind of stimuli, like in the case of pathogen, like TB, uh, I think uh, depending on the time point you're looking at, you can see different forms of death happening at the same time. Yes. So, oh, Edu, Edu, I will, I will uh, ask you a question uh, in these regards. Because uh, during the TB infection in macrophages, um, did you see any kinetics? So how fast is fructosis in comparison to, for, for example, paraptosis and necroptosis in these cells, macrophages infected with, with TB? Yeah, I did. So I did titration, like um, bacterial titration and also time points, different time points. Um, we see some small effect after 24 hours of infection, but uh, it's a very late uh, form of death. So usually I see better uh, readout late on. Like I'm thinking about the wild type condition, okay? So forget uh, in the absence of any yes, 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 yes. The wild type, wild type. Usually we see uh, a bigger change when we do a higher dose, and um, and later time point. So um, there are papers showing um, pyroptosis, uh, ne necroptosis, but most of those papers, they look at a um, short time point and the chains are not that big. So that's why uh, it's tricky. So, but there is a beautiful paper in TB field, which I, I really think that everyone that works with uh, cell death should do and use those methodology. So they uh, imaged uh, like a well with TB so they could track the cells that were infected or not. Um, and then they that. had cells that uh, were uh, transgenic and they um, expressed uh, ASC and when you have activation of ASC, uh, you have paraptosis going on because you have like the ask spec formation, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. they could see the uh, this um, ASC spec formation uh, in, in the cells that were infected. 
So, and they used that as a readout for paraptosis. And uh, the point is, when they look at the other cells in the same well that were also infected, they saw apoptosis at the same time. They yeah. saw necrosis, which they suggest that might be due to ferroptosis. Um, they saw paraptosis. They didn't look at um, necroptosis, uh, but uh, I would say I would expect to see necroptosis as well. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, I think because of ferroptosis is a form of, uh, we, we can consider as a, a form of death in which your cells lost the ability to control oxidative stress response. I, 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 I don't want to be wrong saying that, but one thing I, 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 I keep thinking about is that this ROS response is going to sensitize our cells to activate different pathways. And if those pathways are not quickly induced, the cells will die through ferroptosis later on. So it depends pathogen by pathogen. So in the case of TB, it's important because TB is, uh, I mean, the TB growth is so long. It takes time, like about 16 hours to proliferate one cycle of proliferation. So that's why the, the, the death we see uh, is always uh, like late on, not early on. So interesting, yes. So beautiful. Yeah, I can send to you the paper. It's beautiful. Send me, send me, send me. The Nature send Communication me. paper ah, send me. published 2021. Send me. So, Luis? Hello, excellent talk to professors. Uh, we have questions, student formations, and the Yaskuru stone industry, or BC1, knockouts, animals behavior in acute systemic inflammations. Um, it's very increasing inflammatory response with these animals and the increased apoptotic cells or not, uh, especially in neuroinflammatory conditions. Sorry, I think I, I, I got lost. Um, what is the, your question specifically? Uh, the, the behavior of uh, knockout animals in, uh, in BC1. And in acute, in, in acute systemic inflammations. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, back one, right? That's what you, what you mean. Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, back one mice, they, um, yeah, they have been. So, there are some papers on showing in colitis, um, fibrosis as well. But they, I think in those papers, they didn't use the full knockout. So, they knocked down the gene. So in colitis and fibrosis, um, also when you have a um, deficiency in back one genes, they see better response in terms of tissue damage. So basically you see less tissue damage, less inflammation in the absence of back one. So it seems that when you bring down the activity of back one, you're gonna uh, also reduce the amount of damage uh, uh, in, in your tissue and also uh, the, the inflammatory response. But one thing is important to say is you're not shutting down um, like the ability of your cells to respond with gamma. You're bringing down the inflammation and, and what this information can cause in the tissue in terms of damage. That's the big point to be aware. I'm telling you that because in my case, I see less gamma production, but doesn't mean that the gamma production I, I've seen, I, the very little gamma I'm seeing in the lung will not protect my mice because I see less bacterial loads. So it's just, it's not, the deficiency of BAC1 uh, will not, um, shut down your protective immune response, your pro-inflammatory response, gonna work as a buffer, you know, gonna just bring a little bit down. So your cells will be able to respond uh, to anything you, you have there, but um, 
you're just gonna bring down a little bit the, the inflammation in the tissue. Thank you. You're welcome. So I do, we are almost 45 minutes late oh. because it was <laughs> fantastic. So oh, thank, thank you. you a lot. I think it is a field that we have so much to study and uh, discover and collaborate. Yeah, so for thank sure. Thank you <laughs> for your amazing talk and this uh, rich discussion here. Yep. So, a lot. Thank you a lot, man. You, it's the record. You received yes. much more uh, you know, questions. questions than, of than course, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's you. amazing. Thank you. No, it was a great, it was a great inviting. talk, uh, uh, Edu. And uh, if you don't mind, we will invite you next year as well. Yes. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank That's you. All right, everyone. You. So see you around 2.30. Okay? Um, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Okay.